Fu, a young and clumsy teahouse waitress, experiences a peaceful life until an accidental drink spilled on the governor's son triggers harassment from the group of samurai. Desperate for help, Fu turns to Mujin, a samurai with a unique breakdancing style fighting technique. Unfortunately, Mujin's conflict with Jin, a precise and traditional swordsman, results in the destruction of the tea house and the accidental killing of the local governor's son. Captured and sentenced to execution, Mujin and Jin are rescued by Fu who hires them as her bodyguards. With no home to return to, Fu seeks a samurai with a sunflower scent and persuades Mujin and Jin to join her on this quest. Despite initial disagreements, the trio embarks on an adventure in an alternate Edo period of Japan, facing challenges as they try to prevent Mujin and Jin from constantly clashing. The story begins when idiot Mujin and idiot Jin face their execution. The local governor, acting like an overweight version of Zoro, ordered his guards to cut the heads of the two idiots. But before we continue the story, let's go back to the time before their execution. Meanwhile, in a dumpling restaurant, the governor's son indulges in squeezing the melons of his b with his subordinates. Fu, a waitress in a kimono, accidentally spills tea on the governor's son. In retaliation, Fu is punished for having one of her fingers cut off. Desperate for help, she calls upon Mujin and promises him free dumplings in return for help. After that, our badass Mujin intervenes, confronting Rujiro, the monkey with an ugly face. In a swift move, Mujin successfully cuts Rujiro's hand. Seeing this, Tupac, Mr. Satan, and Mr. Popo then attack Mujin, who skillfully evades their strikes while Fu nonchalantly leaned on the table like a badass dog, and manages to use a dagger to pierce Tupac's brother's chest. Suddenly, the governor's son interrupts, warning Mujin that his father has three powerful samurai from the Yajiu clan. Unfazed, Mujin cuts the tip of the son's hair, revealing that he hailed from the Ruku Islands. On the other side, an old man kneels and pleads with the governor, while Jin observed the scene from the crowd. Suddenly, the governor, angered by the old man's offering of a coin, throws it back at his face and commands his guards to kill him. As Jin attempts to intervene, a man stops him, revealing that the three ugly monkeys beside the governor are formidable samurai from the Yaju clan. Subsequently, Jin steps in and refers to the three ugly monkeys as morons by cutting down an old man who's done nothing wrong and mocking their boss's rotten ugly face. In anger, the three monkeys charge Jin, but Jin skillfully evades and counters their attacks. The governor was shocked at Jin, who quickly eliminated his three ugly monkeys. On the other side, Mujin held the hands of the governor's son and said to the guards that he would crush all the fingers of their boss, counting to ten, and ordered them to bring the Yaju badass to him. Out of nowhere, Jin entered the restaurant, witnessed the chaotic scene, and promptly exited. However, Mujin, misunderstanding Jin as one of the three Yaju bodyguards, swiftly attacked him. But Jin skillfully dodged and countered all the strikes coming from Mujin. As they backed away from each other, Jin informed Mujin that the three Yaju monkeys were already dead, and he was the one who killed them. Following that, the two idiots continued their intense fight, each with a strong desire to kill the other. Meanwhile, Runjiro, the amputated ugly monkey, began setting the restaurant on fire. In the midst of the chaos, people fled the restaurant. Yet, Mujin and Jin continued their banter inside, arguing about who had a better barber. The situation escalated as Mujin was on fire while Jin nonchalantly embraced the chaos, exhibiting his badass sauna. After that, the two idiots were captured, and the overweight Zoro sentenced them to death by execution. Still, before their execution, the guards tortured the two idiots. As the dumpling restaurant burned, Fu experienced a sense of sadness. Considering Fu's lack of relatives, the kind old couple invited her to join them. However, Fu reassured them that she would be okay on her own. As night fell, Fu tried to convince the ugly guard to let her visit the two idiots, but the ugly pervert guard wanted to kiss her. In exchange, Fu smacked the poor guard's face using her robust getta and scored two goals with a single kick to his sensitive soccer balls, successfully knocking him down. After arriving at the cells of the two idiots, Fu proposed a deal. She offered to help them escape, but they had to promise to do something for her in return. Mujin asked about the nature of the promise. Fu revealed that she was searching for a samurai who smelled of sunflowers and wanted them to find that for her. While Fu struggled to insert the eggplant into her cave. What do you mean by that? I mean, the key to unlock the cell. Sorry, I didn't mean that. A group of monkeys began searching for her. Suddenly, the key to her successful penetration was broken in half. Fu quickly fled to evade the groups of ugly maniac monkeys. The next day, Fu discovered an announcement stating that the two idiots would face execution at sunset. Fu quickly ran straight to the shop of a man with the weirdest, poorest, ugly, low-budget face in the entire world of animes I have ever seen requesting the man to sell her items. Surprisingly, the man agreed, considering himself the city's most handsome and generous guy, and she hurried to run again. At the same time, her massive, juicy, bouncy cannons wiggled in front of my dearest legendary subscriber's eyes. 
following that, the two idiots braced themselves for execution while Fu hurriedly ran, carrying a ladder with her two big bouncy cannons. Overweight Zoro commanded his two ugly guards to sever the heads of the two. Mujin skillfully evaded using his breakdancing maneuvers. Jin also skillfully loosened his tie, swiftly slashing through every monkey and assisting Mujin in freeing himself. Mujin, acknowledging Jin's help, stated that their fight would be put on hold until they escaped. While Fu displays his big fat on the crowd, asking for a firelight. Then, Wiz Khalifa handed her a lighter while Mujin showcased his favorite TikTok dance moves, while Jin showcases his skills like a low-class ninja, surrounded by uglies facing their leader. The fat Zoro begged Jin to spare his life, promising to give him anything he wanted. However, Jin showed no mercy and swiftly slashed the neck of the fat governor. Suddenly, they saw Fu on the roof, igniting her two massive cannons and hurling them inside the palace, causing an explosion with a massive display of fireworks. Everyone was dazzled by the light, prompting them to rush outside, fearing the impact of the fireworks. Both Mujin and Jin successfully escaped the scene. As they fled the scene, Mujin teased Jin, suggesting they should finally settle their unfinished business. Fu interrupted them and reminded them of the promise they made to her. She questioned the two, expressing concern that if they ended up killing each other, who would accompany her on her journey? She then suggested flipping a coin, explaining that if it landed heads up, they could go ahead and fight each other, but if it came up tails, they would both stay with her. After that, Mujin tossed the coin high into the air. As the coin fell, it landed on Fu's forehead. The two idiots leaned in to see the result, and it turned out to be tails, as Fu confirmed she was happy winning the toss. But they were interrupted by the guards coming to arrest them. As they ran, Fu stumbled on her feet and lost her balance. On the next day, the ugly amputated arm Rujiro walks into the prison holding a key, while the guard behind him tries to stop him. Rujiro released Aniwakamaru, a, k, a, Big Show. He encouraged Big Show to get out and kill all the people who tormented him because Big Show had painful memories of people mocking and hurting him because of his ugly poor face. Meanwhile, the trio successfully evades the guards and reaches a tea house where Fu holds grilled manju buns. As Fu put away the buns to Mujin, a bird quickly swooped in and snatched them away. Jin overheard a conversation at another table about missing people in the mountains, with a rumor that ogres were involved. Mujin swiftly grabbed and devoured the fat man's buns, then tossed a stick in the air, skillfully slicing it in half to showcase his impressive swordsmanship. After that, Mujin and the two silly men entered the tea house for more buns. While boasting, Fu interjects and reminds him of their deal, not prioritizing killing the ogres. The overweight man reassured Fu and proposed that she join them. While enjoying a drink with the two maniac men, Fu suddenly felt dizzy and lost consciousness. The tea house owner advised them to stay in a nearby shack near the hot springs for the night, warning them that the sunset would soon approach. On the mountain, Jin and Mujin start to walk. While Fu sleeps and snores carefree, Mujin comments he would her on that dumb board. <laughs> and Jin expresses unease about the restaurant owner they encountered earlier. Suddenly, the two idiots halt as they spot Eva Elfie walking barefoot towards them. At the same time, at the tea house, Rujiro praised the owner for his good work, but Big Show appeared and strangled him. Back on the mountain, Eva Elfie thanked Mujin for his help. With a maniacal expression, Mujin replied that it wasn't free and asked her how much she could offer. On the other side, two Kanto officers patrolled the mountain. Mujin and Jin reached the shack and placed Fu inside. Mujin bid his goodbye to meet Eva Elfie. At Eva Elfie's house, Mujin enjoyed while Eva Elfie laid on him. Eva asked Mujin to enjoy the night without playing coy. She added that nights are like human lives, brief and fleeting. In the shack, Fu snored loudly like a tired, badass tour bus driver. Upon waking, she was shocked to see Rujiro and Big Show present. Rujiro kicked her, urging her to go back to sleep. Meanwhile, in the hot spring, Jin was surprised to find the old man in the tea house. The old man shared that two male fireflies attract each other. Jin stood up as he felt embarrassed. The old man mentioned hearing about the existence of the sunflower samurai. At the same time, Rujiro is arrested by the two Kanto officers for arson. The officers were shocked as they saw Big Show ugly rotten face and called him a monster. Enraged, Big Show attacked and killed the two officers. Fu woke up and witnessed the scene. After that, in an abandoned shack, Fu is guarded by Big Show, expressing how people hate him for his ugly face. He then recalls his past, where people mocked him for his ugly face, leading to a loss of control where he killed many. Fu approached Big Show, unafraid, and noticed the sadness in his eye. But they were interrupted by Rujiro, instructing Big Show to prepare for the party. At the same time, Eva began to undress and our badass Mujin was waiting on the floor like Johnny Sins. Man, we gonna f*** tonight.
Evo lay down on top of Mugen and started to kiss him. Mugen noticed something off. He kicked Evo away, spat out something from her kiss, and questioned her about it. Eva revealed it was night mushroom juice, a deadly poison. Mugen, alarmed, grabbed his sword and confronted her. Eva explained that Rujiro ordered her to do it, and he had the antidote. She added that at that time, Fu was in the hands of Rujiro. He hurriedly returned to the shack and noticed no one was inside. On the other hand, Jin followed the old man to verify the existence of the sunflower samurai. Suddenly, the old man approached and initiated an attack to kill Jin. Still, Jin managed to deflect all his strikes, and they started exchanging slashes. At the same time, Mujin walks and feels weak because of the poison. Suddenly, Big Show attacks him from behind, and Rujiro appears with Fu tied. Rujiro mocked Mujin about regretting cutting his arm, but Mujin, unfazed, questioned who he was, angering Rujiro. Conversely, Jin and the old man engage in another round of intense exchanges, and Rujiro taunted Mujin by revealing the antidote, stating he had only one night before death, and laughed. Mujin leaped to attack Big Show and successfully slashed his cape hood, showing his embarrassed, ugly face. In retaliation, Big Show smacked Mujin's face, sending him to be thrown away. Rujiro stops Big Show from killing Mujin, wanting Mujin to suffer more and die slowly. He then kicked Mugen toward the river. He declared that he wouldn't let Mugen die quickly, intending to torture him and make him suffer first. Out of nowhere, Fu successfully pushes Rujiro into the river. <laughs> Enraged, he slaps Fu and decides to finish her first, pointing the blade at her neck. Suddenly, Big Show intervenes, strangling and lifting Rujiro, saving Fu from imminent danger and cracking Rujiro's neck, leaving him lifeless. Mugen swiftly grabs his sword and charges towards Big Show. As they brace for the clash, Fu shouts and tries to stop them. Big Show unexpectedly releases and drops his weapon. Mugen seizes the opportunity, driving his sword into Big Show's abdomen. On the other side, the old man ran, glancing back at the scene, and informed Jin that his client had left and died. In essence, he no longer had a reason to kill Jin. He then left and told Jin that they would meet again one day. Meanwhile, Fu questions Big Show about why he protected her. He reveals it's because she's the first person not afraid of him, making him feel less alone. Big Show lifts his hand, letting fireflies land on his finger. Fu feels sadness as Big Show dies. The next day, Fu witnessed the two idiots engaging in another clash. As they walk, Fu advises the two not to kill each other until they find the samurai who smells like sunflowers. Suddenly, Mujin stops and signals for Jin to come close. Mujin shoulders Jin, whispering something to him, leaving Fu confused about the antics of the two. After that, Mugen shouted, wishing Fu the best of luck. The Ferrari and Mustang immediately sped off, each going its own way. Fu was furious and couldn't believe the actions of the two idiots. After that, Mugen reaches a village and enters a restaurant where many monkeys enjoy a feast. He sits beside them and starts eating their food. The owner stops him, whispering that they are Yakuza. Mugen declared that Yakuza are those guys who can't even take a piss, causing the ugly monkeys to piss at him, shouting that they are the Bagatomi gang. One of the monkeys stopped him. Mugen grinned, took a stick, and stabbed it into the ugly monkey's hand, and another monkey tried to stab him. He dodged and used his dagger, pointing at the monkey's neck. The Yakuza boss intervenes, stating that he likes Mugen's swordsmanship, and asks Mugen to come and offer him something he wants to eat. Meanwhile, a crowd gathers around at the gambling place owned by the Yakuza boss. An old man named Dagger wished for his luck and bet on even. After that, an ugly guy loudly declared that the winning combination was odd. Daegaru felt sorrow due to losing his bet. Suddenly, a man held his shoulder named Ishimatsu, the Taguro of the Bagatomi gang, Damn! prompted him to settle his debt. Following that, a young girl named Osuzu tutored a child named Sausuke. They were taken aback when they overheard Daegaru, Osuzu's father, pleading with Ishimatsu to take everything except his shop. Osuzu interjects, calling her father. Ishimatsu saw Osuzu, suggesting they could take something else from his house if he couldn't pay. Meanwhile, Jin arrived at the restaurant and asked the owner if he knew where he could earn some money. Seeing Jin's sword, the owner asked if he was a hired swordsman. He explained that the town was once under the kind Kawara gang, led by a kind-hearted boss named Hitero. However, the situation changed six months ago when a new group, the Nagatomi Gang, arrived, completely altering the town's dynamics. The owner offers Jin soup even without payment. The owner suggested if he wanted to earn money quickly, he should join the Nagatomi Gang and be hired as a bodyguard. Afterward, at Hitero's residence, Osuzu and Daegaru sought help, fearing their business would be taken over. Hitero expressed a desire to assist them but emphasized the need for proof of cheating to take any action. 
a subordinate chimed in, noting that the whole town was falling victim to the Nagatomi gang's gambling schemes, losing businesses and even daughters. They feared the gang would take over the entire territory. Meanwhile, three idiots from the Nagatomi gang entered the restaurant. They were taken aback when angry Sausuk confronted them to retrieve Osuzu's panty. Despite drawing his sword, the ugly monkey kicked him on his feet, causing him to drop to the ground. The three idiots continued to kick him and mock him to go home and suck more milk from his mother's melons. Jin intervened swiftly drew his sword, skillfully slicing their clothes. With his sword pointed at them, Sausuk determined to retrieve Osuzu's panties. As the three idiots retreated, they returned Osuzu's panty, wishing Sausuk to choke on it. What do you mean? <laughs> what, do you, what do you mean? <laughs> what do you mean? Meanwhile, at the crab restaurant, Mujin relished eating whole crabs like chips. The Yakuza boss proposed that Mujin join forces with him, planning to take over the entire village using his money and Mujin's strengths. At the same time, Fu reached the village and encountered a fake fortune teller who cautioned her to be wary of vases. On the other side, Saosuk thanked Jin, but Jin had already left the place. He then ran to follow Jin, informing him that he would talk to his father to hire Jin as a bodyguard. The three crying babies quickly reported to their boss that the Kawara gang had hired a skilled swordsman. Mujin laughed and assured the boss that he would handle the matter himself. Jealous, Ishimatsu taunted Mujin into a duel and struck him immediately. As they exchanged slashes, the boss intervened, instructing Ishimatsu to retrieve Osuzu. While running, Fu accidentally collided with a man carrying a vase, and the two maniacs man forcefully grabbed her because she couldn't pay for the broken vases. On the other hand, Osuzu was forced to come by Ishimatsu. Her father interjected, but Ishimatsu informed him they would take her to work to settle his debt. As they leave, Hitero asks him to stop, but Ishimatsu declares he no longer works for him. On the other side, Fu was locked up and needed to work at a brothel until she could earn payment for the broken bases. Subsequently, Sausuk brought Jin to meet his father and requested to hire him as a bodyguard. However, his father declined and informed him that the Nagatomi gang had taken Osuzu to work at the brothel. Sausuk urged Jin to accompany him, stating he would hire him if the Kawara gang didn't want to. However, his father intervened, trying to stop him. But Sausuk rushed out, saying he would smash those Nagatomi bastards. At night, Fu and Osuzu met at the brothel, where Osuzu revealed that she had to work to repay her father's debt. Sausuk and Jin hid in a dark alley, carefully observing the guards around the place. Meanwhile, Mujin was bored as the boss ordered him to stand by and wait. The boss reassured Mujin that the Kawara guards would come, using Osuzu as bait. After that, Jin and Sausuk donned disguises and approached a guard, inquiring about available jobs. The guard directed them inside to wait. Once inside, the guards requested Jin to play something on his shamisen. Seizing the moment, he swiftly drew his sword from the shamisen, shedding his disguise along with Sausuk. Mujin quickly rushed in upon hearing that there was an intruder. They were both surprised to see each other. Out of nowhere, Fu interjected, shouting at the two and demanding to know why they were there. After that, Mujin rushed towards Jin to begin their battle. Following that, nervous customers hurriedly fled the place. Mujin and Jin initiated their clash, exchanging strikes while Fu tried to stop them, while Sausuk urged Osuzu to come with him for an escape. However, Osuzu declined and apologized to Sausuk. Soon after, Ishimatsu managed to chain Sausuk and pulled him outside. Back to the two idiots, they continued their clash, exchanging skillful strikes. The boss intervenes and summons his monkeys. Mujin was pissed and ordered the monkeys to stay out of his fight. In a fit of anger, Mujin swiftly charged in, slashing every monkey in his path. Everyone was stunned by Mujin's sudden aggression. Jin quickly grabbed his shamisen and triggered an explosion, creating a cloud of dust. Jin and Sausuk successfully escaped, while Mujin pursued them. Following that, Ishimatsu urged his boss to eliminate Mujin immediately. However, the boss refused. Meanwhile, Jin and Sausuk hide under the bridge, advising Sausuk to dismantle the Nagatomi gang to save Osuzu. At the same time, Fu urged Osuzu to escape. Still, Osuzu refused, expressing concern that running away might result in her father being killed. Meanwhile, Mujin confronted the boss for stopping him from killing Jin. The boss explained his belief in the efficient ruling, stating there are rulers and the ruled. Mujin, uninterested, declared he only believed in his own skills and warned the boss about sending tough opponents after him. Leaving the room, Mujin encountered Ishimatsu, who also admitted believing in his own skills, but cautioned Mujin about the world's complexity. Mujin advised him not to make excuses and emphasized the freedom to choose one's own path in life. Meanwhile, at the brothel, Sausuk managed to enter, observing the two maniac guards forcing Grabo Suzu's hand and scrape on his wrapped ugly face. Driven by anger, Sausuk lunged forward, stabbing the maniac guard in the buttocks with his enraged bag sword. The other guard was shocked, witnessing his fellow guard losing his virginity to Sausuk. Osuzu was shocked by Sausuk's unexpected action. 
After that, Ishimatsu brought Sausuke to the Kawara gang's place, revealing Sausuke's act of killing a guard during their business. Hitero solemnly expressed his responsibility for the situation. Following that, Sausuke was presented before Hitero and the boss. Hitero claimed full responsibility for his son's actions. The boss proposed a non-violent resolution through a gambling match. If Hitero won, Sausuke would be returned, and in exchange, the boss would take control of Hitero's territory. Hitero agreed to the gambling match but requested fairness, his gang would supply the dice roller, and the boss's gang would provide the dice. Simultaneously, Mujin was leaving the village when he recalled that Fu had been captured by the Nagatomi gang. At the brothel, a woman overheard a rumor about the gambling match between the Kawara and Nagatomi gangs. This news left Osuzu feeling worried about the agreement between the two gangs. Later, at Kawara's place, everyone felt uneasy about the upcoming agreement. Simultaneously, Jin revisited the old man's restaurant, settling the bill for his meal from the previous day. Upon leaving the restaurant, Jin noticed Hitero waiting for him outside. Jin and Hitero engaged in a conversation and handed him something to give to Sausuk. Meanwhile, at the brothel, Fu wore an angry expression to dissuade a customer from selecting her. But suddenly, Takamiya demanded that he like Fu to cuddle him. He forced Fu into a room where he attempted to pill Fu's juicy melons. Super Momo intervened by biting Takamiya's finger. Seizing the moment, Fu smashed Takamiya using a vase and successfully escaped the brothel. As Fu ran, she asked the two Keigo guys about the location of the gambling house. The Keigo guys invited her to hop in. At the gambling place, both sides waited for the dice roller from Kawara's gang to arrive. Simultaneously, Mujin arrived at the brothel, searching for Fu. The bitches informed him that Fu had escaped. Meanwhile, at the gambling house, the Kawara guards anxiously waited for their dice roller. Fu arrived and asked if it was the gambling house, to which everyone welcomed her and rushed her to go inside. Fu entered the room, surprising Jin. Realizing the situation, Fu had no choice but to act as the dice roller. She skillfully threw the dice, covered it with a vase, and asked them to place their bets. The boss bet on odd, and Hitero bet on even. Fu revealed the dice, showing an odd combination. The fortune teller declared the Nagatomi gang as the winner. Hitero admitted defeat but had no intention of surrendering his territory to them. Instead, he offered his life as atonement. The boss mocked Hitero for his actions, and Sausuke defended his father. The boss declared that he would take Kawara territory by force and warn Jin. Suddenly, Mujin burst into the room, observing the tense scene. The boss asked why he was there. Mujin, since nobody was coming after him, he decided to go after them instead. Following that, our badass Mujin rushed forward, killing every guard in his path. Jin also defeated the guards behind him. After that, the Kawara guards entered the room, clashing with the Nagatomi gang. The boss managed to escape but was pursued by Ishimatsu. As the boss tried to flee, Ishimatsu intercepted and killed him. Following that, Jin handed Sausuke the item left by Hitero. Sausuke inquired if Ishimatsu would return to the Kawara gang, stating that his father wished him to lead them. Ishimatsu thanked for the offer but declined, then approached Mujin, expressing a desire to settle one last matter. After that, Sausuke and Osuzu bid farewell to Jin and Fu, while Mujin and Ishimatsu confronted each other near the lake. Charging forward, they exchanged slashes. In a momentary pause, Ishimatsu coughed up blood and kneeled lifeless. The next day, the trio continued their journey. Fu asked about the boat's cost, hoping for a discount. But the man rejected it and suggested they start swimming instead. Following that, an undercover policeman named Manzu Sakami was investigating a man named Morinobu Hishikawa, a painter, suspecting him as the mastermind behind the disappearance of adolescent girls. Fu encounters Morinobu at the restaurant and treats them to food. As the two idiots depart, Fu instructs them to find money to cover the boat rides. Morinobu was stunned by Fu's beauty and desired to paint her on clothes. I love you, Holmes. Meanwhile, Mujin encountered the three ugly monkeys who were busy with their magazine. A rotten-faced monkey with cyan hair immediately attacked Mujin. Still, Mujin easily defeated them without even drawing his sword. After that, in a small alley, Mujin bullied the three ugly monkeys and stole their money. Simultaneously, Morinabu guided Fu through the art shop where he displayed his paintings. Fu was captivated, especially by the artwork featuring sunflowers. Out of nowhere, Morinabu used his riz and asked Fu if she was interested in entering his world of art. He added that Fu only needed to do posing as a model, and he would pay her time in exchange. Little did they know, Manzu overheard their conversation. Meanwhile, Jin enjoyed seeing the ocean and encountered an old man who had neglected his dental hygiene for quite some time. Oh! Jin noticed something wrong with the shogi. When he leaves, the old man stops Jin and challenges him to the game. The old man will give him a pouch of pennies if he wins, and Jin will serve the old man in exchange. Meanwhile, Mujin buys grilled squid with the money from the ugly monkeys. After that, the monkey with cyan hair reports to Lady Sawa at the art shop that they are mugged. 
who reacts with a punch inspired by Manny Pacquiao and couldn't believe that her three ugly monkeys had been robbed. Afterward, Mudin finished his grilled squid and a sudden realization hit him regarding the expense of their boat fare. He then spotted the cyan-haired monkey and greeted it casually. The monkey sprinted away as Mujin pursued. Suddenly, Mujin halted upon spotting Fu with the pervert painter Morinabu. Mujin questioned Fu on what she was doing there. Fu informed Mujin that she had taken on a job as a model for Morinabu's paintings. Following that, Morinabu began painting Fu. However, he found Fu's shoulder unsatisfactory and asked her to lower her sleeve slightly. Daddy, chill. While Morinabu demonstrating a trendy TikTok dance, he quickly clarified that his request wasn't meant to be perverted. He then informed Fu that they were doing this for the sake of art. Fu granted his request and lowered her sleeves a bit. Outside, Manzu trembled while clutching his long rigid truncheon. <laughs> closely observing the two inside. On the other side, the old man and Jin commenced their match. The elderly man commended Jin for his skill in playing shogi and inquired about his learning source. Jin replied that he had learned it at the dojo with his master. Meanwhile, Morinabu finished his painting, and Fu eagerly approached to see the results. Unexpectedly, three ugly monkeys entered, thanking Morinabu for his help and promptly seizing Fu. At the same time, the old man noticed that the sun had set and suggested to Jin that they resume their game the next day. On the other side, the ugly monkeys locked up Fu. While Morinabu ran, Lady Sawa stopped him. She cornered him into the dark alley and expressed a desire not to let him go home that night, craving the sensation of stroking Morinabu's paintbrush. Cut the cameras. However, Morinabu declined, citing a stomachache, and promised to return the next day. Why are you running? Why are you running? Subsequently, Morinabu helped Fu to get out. But Fu slapped him and asked how many girls he had deceived. Suddenly, Lady Sawa intervened and remarked that Morinabu seemed to be interested in a young version of her. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mujin inquired with Jin about Fu's whereabouts. The following day, Jin and the old man resumed their shogi match, and Lady Sawa sold Fu's painting to a customer. While Mujin visited Morinabu's place in search of Fu and was surprised to hear the ugly monkeys taunting Morinabu as a traitor, Mujin questioned Morinabu about Fu's location. Desperate for Mujin's help, Morinabu revealed that Fu was to be sold, confessing that the art shop was a front for exploiting his paintings as a catalog to sell girls to Europeans. Simultaneously, the ugly monkeys hurriedly loaded barrels onto boats. As they arrived at the place, it was already empty. Out of the blue, Manzu popped out, wearing his sumo-embroidered thong underwear, catching the two by surprise. Oh! Following that, Mujin managed to follow them, leaping onto their boat. He swiftly executed kicks and headbutts, sending the monkeys tumbling off the boat. Despite this, the ugliest monkey managed to escape carrying Fu. Mujin pursued them, entering through the back door of the art shop. Mujin managed to stop the ugly monkey from fleeing. Surprisingly, he saw Jin peacefully playing shogi against the old man. Unexpectedly, the police arrested Lady Sawa. However, Manzu intervened, revealing that her husband used their store as a front for illegal trade with foreign ships. He presented Fu in the magazine as evidence. Out of nowhere, the old man laughed as Jin checkmated him in Shogi. Still, Manzu declared to the old man that he was the one being arrested. Afterward, the old man was arrested and tossed a pouch toward Jin, recalling their previous bets. Fu and Mujin's jaw dropped as they saw the gold pennies. Meanwhile, Fu held the pouch of pennies and turned around as someone called her. It was Morinabu apologizing to her and proudly displaying the result of his painting, expressing himself as her number one fan and promising never to forget her. Fu angrily tossed the magazine at Morinabu. Mujin inquired if she wanted to let Morinabu go, and Fu agreed, citing Morinabu's portrayal of her with big hooters. The two idiots teasingly questioned Fu about the hooters. Following that, the trio continued their journey until they reached Edo City. Everyone was intrigued by the troops of samurais wearing kamuso. Due to a lack of money, the trio decided to participate in an eating contest to get a free meal, staking their belongings as a registration fee. Subsequently, the eating contest commenced. The announcer, Ikiyaman, declared that the winner would take home all the entry fees and the pot prize. Ikiyaman acknowledged Izumi as the queen of sweet and Saunasuke as the defending champion. Waiters hurriedly served contestants with new bowls. Jin felt embarrassed and implored Mujin to win, to retrieve his sword. After an hour of eating, participants began to vomit and lose consciousness. Jin mocked Mujin for not ceasing to eat, suggesting his swords were in line. However, Mujin eventually succumbed and collapsed. 
The contest persisted, leaving four contestants, Saunasuk, Izumi, a mysterious giant, and Fu. Meanwhile, as they reached the 22nd bowl, matching last year's record, Izumi struggled to hold back vomit and surrender. Also, Saunasuk suddenly felt dizzy and lost consciousness, while Fu shouted for another bowl. Fu and the giant reached a remarkable 27 bowls in a one-on-one -on -one showdown. Suddenly, annoyed by a fly, Fu tried to swat it away. Ikiman unexpectedly declared that she had given up, leaving Fu shocked, unaware that the gesture signaled surrender. Ikiman announced that the giant won the contest. In the meantime, the trio pondered over how to retrieve their belongings. Suddenly, the giant guy approached, praising Fu for their impressive battle. Mujin noticed the giant's accent, Jin observed his blue eyes, and Fu noted his red hair. The giant assured that he was Japanese and introduced himself as Jiaoji. Jin asked for the return of his swords. Jiaoji declined, stating that it wouldn't be free. Instead, he proposed that Jin work as a tour guide as he wanted to explore the tourist spots of Edo City. In return, Jiaoji would give back Jin's swords, a deal to which Jin agreed. In the meantime, Japanese police troops circulated around Edo City, informing and questioning people about the European guy wandering in disguise. On the other side, the four idiots reached the famous Kaminari man, and Jiaoji was amazed and delighted. After that, they visited a sushi vendor, but Jiaoji didn't enjoy it. Meanwhile, the police troops arrived at the venue of the eating contest and inquired with Ikiman about the European guy. Ikiman asked if they were referring to the giant man, leaving the police surprised at the accuracy of Ikiman's description. As night descended, they relished watching a fireworks display in the city. Afterward, they headed to a restaurant for dinner. Following that, they were taken aback when the police intervened and surrounded them. Mujin interjected, stood up, and asked Jiaoji to hand over his sword. But Jiaoji declined. The police noticed Jiaoji's accent and pointed out his European origin, instructing their men to arrest them. However, Mujin skillfully evades their attacks while Jin successfully disarms another by breaking his sword with a teapot. Mujin once again showcased his favorite TikTok moves. Following that, Jin shouted for them to escape. As they sprinted, the police attempted to pursue them, but they managed to hide. Fu scolded the two idiots, pointing out their reckless actions. Because of that, they couldn't search for the Sunflower Samurai in Edo City. Meanwhile, the samurai troops in Kamuso arrived at the restaurant, witnessing the chaotic aftermath. Following that, the four idiots arrived at Yamato Nechiko's place. Jiaoji informed them that he would return their belongings after they finished watching Yamato Nechiko's performance. As they watched the traditional Nihon Buyo dance, Jiaoji was captivated by the performer's elegance. Fu attempted to inform Jiaoji that the dancer was a man. But Jiaoji abruptly stood from his seat, eager to meet the lovely young lady backstage. Following that, Jiaoji was shocked, unable to believe that the beautiful young lady he had watched on stage was, in fact, a man. Fu attempted to calm Jiaoji, but they were taken aback when he declared his preference for men over women. He blushed like a blossom when the man in front of him was his type. He then confessed to them that he was not Japanese. He reminisced about his previous life in their country, where he was treated like a crazy person. However, he then encountered a book by Seikaku Ihara of Japan named The Great Mirror of Male Love. From the book, he learned that the path of sexuality is not something that incites chaotic carnal desires to erupt. He then realized that Japan was like heaven on earth. After that, Japanese police arrived to arrest them, citing the prohibition of foreigners according to their laws. The situation took a surprising turn when the samurais wearing Kamuso revealed their true faces, and the Japanese troops were astounded to see that they were all Europeans. The Japanese police officer ordered to arrest them all and surrender peacefully. Still, Mujin, annoyed, threw his geta toward the officer's face. However, Jiaoji interjected, tossing Mujin's sword and Jin's as well. Jiaoji was impressed by Mujin's swordsmanship. He attempted to follow them, and the European officer with a mustache tried to stop him. The four idiots entered the stage, surprising the audience, who believed they were part of the show. They were surrounded by Japanese troops, but the European troops intervened presenting a letter. They then revealed that Jiaoji's true identity is the chief merchant of the Dutch East India Company's Japan branch, Governor General Izak Titsing. The Japanese troops immediately vowed and begged for his forgiveness. The hairless guy introduced himself as Tsukiman Tanaka as their interpreter. The mustache guy said they had been searching for Jiaoji to his return. However, Jiaoji didn't want to return, so the mustache guy pleaded with him, which Jiaoji affirmed. After that, Mujin and Jin bid their farewell to Jiaoji. Fu asked Jiaoji if he knew anything about the samurai who smelled of sunflowers. Jiaoji, however, was unaware of the sunflower samurai and asked Fu if she had any more clues. Fu unexpectedly pulled out a skull pendant from her melons that belonged to the sunflower samurai. 
Jiaoji, surprised, cautioned Fu to keep it hidden, as it was a dangerous item in that country. He advised her not to let anyone see it. Confused, Fu asked him why. But Jiaoji could only share one thing, if she went to Nagasaki, she might find some answers. Meanwhile, as the two idiots walked ahead, Fu hurried to catch up, informing them they would be heading to Nagasaki. The following day, the trio resumes their journey and has a stroke of luck winning at gambling. Later, while ordering food, Shinsuke swiftly snatches Fu's money. Mujin and Jin tried to chase him, but he hid in the dark alley. Following that, four idiot monkeys argued over who could eat bananas the fastest. The monkey with the ugliest face pocketed their gold bar. Subsequently, Shinsuke collided with him and managed to steal their gold bar, prompting the monkeys to chase him. Despite their efforts, Shinsuke escaped, leaving the ugliest monkey in frustration. As night fell, Mujin and Jin raided Shinsuke's house like an FBI agent. FBI, open up! Interrogating his mother. However, she professed ignorance, denying having a son at all. Jin expressed remorse upon noticing the woman's grave illness. After that, Jin and Mujin left Fu to watch over the house, expecting Shinsuke to return. Following that, Shinsuke sold the gold bar to Hikoichi so he could buy medicine for his sick mother. Meanwhile, Fu woke up upon hearing Shinsuke return home. Shinsuke's mother expressed concern and asked why he was working so late. Shinsuke explained that he needed to work extra to afford better medicine for her. Concerned, his mother asked if he had done something wrong, mentioning that Mujin and Jin had come looking for him. But Shinsuke declined, stating that he hadn't done anything wrong. Suddenly, his mother coughed, and Shinsuke reassured her not to worry and advised her to rest. On the other side, Fu felt lonely as she observed their situation. Meanwhile, Fu informed the two that Shinsuke didn't return home that night. The next day, Jin woke up to the sound of Mujin snoring loudly like a cow. Fu returned to the house and was surprised when Shinsuke's mother referred to her as one of Shinsuke's hot chicks. Inside, Fu enjoyed the treats, but then Shinsuke's mother asked if they had done anything resembling the orange and black logo, as Shinsuke had been acting oddly lately. Meanwhile, Shinsuke visited the doctor to buy better medicine for his sick mother. While Hikoichi was interrogated and tortured with fire by the four ugly monkeys to retrieve their stolen gold bar. On the other hand, Shinsuke caught up with Fu, but the four ugly monkeys intervened, pointing a dagger at them. Fu shouted for help, trying to distract the four ugly monkeys and successfully escaping. As they ran, the police stopped them. Without a choice, Shinsuke pulled out a dagger and pointed it at Fu, pretending to hold her hostage. He warned the police not to get close to him and managed to enter a house. Inside the house, Shinsuke shouted at the police not to try to enter or else he would kill her. Fu noticed he was bleeding, but Shinsuke told her not to mind the wounds. Meanwhile, the police outside surrounded the house. On the other hand, the four ugly monkeys watched the scene from the crowd, devising a plan to enter without being spotted by the police. On the inside, Fu covered Shinsuke's wound using a piece of cloth torn from her bra and admitted that she had already met his mother. Shinsuke asked her if she had told his mother he was a pickpocket. Fu explained she didn't tell his mother about his pickpocketing because she didn't want to worry such a good mother. Shinsuke explained that he resorted to pickpocketing because nobody in town would hire him due to his young age, and he needed the money to buy medicine for his sick mother. Following that, the police urged him to surrender. However, Mujin and Jin observed the scene, and a man explained that a girl had been hostage. Shocked to see Fu, Mujin immediately rushed, but the police stopped him. Meanwhile, the four ugly monkeys enter the house, while Fu pleads for him to surrender, but he refused to give up. Fu decided to help him escape, but their plans were disrupted when the ugly monkeys intervened. Meanwhile, Mujin broke through the door, kicked one of the monkeys in the face, and ordered them to leave. However, Fu insisted on letting Shinsuke go. As the police entered, causing panic among the monkeys, the ugliest one ordered to kill them all. Despite this, Shinsuke broke a window, thanked Fu for her help, and promised to repay her someday before jumping out. Fu followed him, but the police managed to surround Shinsuke as he tried to run. Shinsuke pulled out a knife, but the police managed to stab him first. Fu felt heartbroken as tears welled up in her eyes, witnessing Shinsuke's death. The next day, Fu visited Shinsuke's house. His mother asked if something was wrong because her son hadn't returned home the previous night. She expressed her concern, feeling that something had happened to her son. Accepting it as something she had always expected to happen someday, she asked Fu again if Shinsuke had done something bad because she believed he was paying the price for it, and that's why he wasn't coming back. After that, the trio began their journey and left the town. The next day, Nagamitsu creates a scene with his side mirror and a beatboxer. <laughs> mistaking another man for Jin. 
Despite the man's protests that he isn't Jin, Nagamitsu lunges forward to attack him. Meanwhile, the trio walks, looking worn out, and reaches the pawn shop. Fu attempted to pawn her dagger, but the owner refused due to its numerous scratches. Mujin tried to pawn his sword, but the owner declined because it lacked a brand. Fu and Mujin encouraged Jin to pawn his sword. Still, their attention was caught when the owner noticed Jin's distinctive sunglasses. Following that, at the restaurant, the trio enjoyed their meals. Nagamitsu entered and blushed upon seeing Fu, finding her attractive. His beatboxer offered a pearl to Fu, but she declined. Nagamitsu then approached Fu, calling her a honey and introducing himself. However, he was interrupted when his side mirror informed him that he found Jin. Nagamitsu quickly gave Fu his calling card in case she wanted to flirt with him and left the place abruptly. The waiter offered Mujin a drink, indicating that a lady customer wanted to give it to him. Mujin became infatuated upon seeing the attractive woman. The lady approached them and invited the two idiots to join her for a drink and to water her feminine flower. Without hesitation, Mujin immediately grabbed Jin and followed the lady. In a fit of anger, Fu decides to confront Nagamitsu as she feels jealous. Meanwhile, Nagamitsu encountered the fake Jin while Fu watched from the crowd. The fake Jin lunged forward and managed to disarm Nagamitsu, but the sword accidentally fell on his head. Nagamitsu called it a flying dragon sword, impressing the crowd. Surprised to find Fu, he invited her for a date on the hill. Following that, at the bar, Mujin enjoyed a drink with Lexi Lore while Jin was already drunk and feeling sleepy. Lexi expressed her longing for the warmth of human touch. Mujin, being the daring type, asked for another drink. Lexi noticed his strong drinking prowess and leaned on him, secretly slipping something into his glass. As Mujin drank it, he began to feel dizzy and soon lost consciousness. On the other side, Fu and Nagamitsu went up the hill. Nagamitsu offered his autobiography to Fu, claiming that it contained his entire life story, from the past to the future, making him known as the number one samurai in the world. Fu read about his journey and encounters with other samurai weaklings he defeated. He then heard whispered rumors of a legendary man, Inshiro Maria, who was undefeated in a thousand duels. If he could beat Inshiro and take over his legend of a thousand victories, his reputation would be boosted. So he went to Inshiro's place, but he was too late, the remaining disciples had already killed him. The one who struck down the legendary undefeated Inshiro was none other than his top pupil. Fu asked if that was why he attacked all the samurais he encountered. Nagamitsu confirmed that he only knew about the top pupil who defeated Inshiro, who wore glasses, and his name was Jin. Fu was shocked upon hearing the name Jin and expressed her wish for Nagamitsu to find Jin someday. She then bid him goodbye and hurriedly ran off. Following that, Fu went into a bath, squeezing her water balloons, contemplating that bigger doesn't necessarily mean better. Suddenly, a realization struck her, questioning whether Jin indeed killed his master because she knew Jin would never do something like that. The next day, as Fu woke up, she found the two idiots sleeping beside the road canal. She was shocked and shouted to see blood at Mujin's mouth, causing the two idiots to wake up. The two noticed their money was stolen by Lexi. After that, Fu bumped the heads of the two and ordered them to get out and earn it back. Following that, Fu gathered a crowd, promising them they would be amazed by the two idiots' astounding sword techniques. Then, she asked the two what they would do. In a brief moment, Fu balanced two pearls on her head. The two idiots blindfolded themselves and charged forward, successfully slicing the pearls in half, leaving the crowd amidst applause and awe. After that, as they walked, Fu whispered to Mujin and asked if he knew anything about Jin's past. Mujin replied that he didn't know anything and suggested she ask Jin herself. At the pawn shop, Nagamitsu attempted to pawn his Lamborghini. Suddenly, the trio entered, and Jin asked the owner for his glasses, which they had pawned yesterday. Fu was surprised to see Nagamitsu and signaled Jin not to wear his glasses. Nagamitsu noticed Jin and inquired about his name. Jin introduced himself as Jin, prompting the side mirror guy to identify himself as one of Inshiro's pupils and accuse Jin of being a traitor for killing their master. But Jin requested them to step outside. Outside, the side mirror guy and Jin faced each other, with the former warning Jin that he would meet his death as a consequence of killing their master. The mirror guy lunged forward to attack, but Jin deflected all his attacks and skillfully disarmed him. The side mirror guy requested Jin to kill him, but Jin said he already had his peace and ordered him to tell the other pupils about that, letting him live. Suddenly, a dog intervened, and Nagamitsu immediately hugged the dog. Lexi also intervened, calling Nagamitsu honey, apologizing to Jin, and kissing him because his husband was an idiot. After that, Lexi pitched Nagamitsu and mocked him, saying their children waited for them with empty stomachs, leaving the three confused. On the other side, an old policeman named Mr. Yamani was reading their daily logbook when a young man approached him to express sadness about Mr. Yamani's retirement, as it was his last day on duty. Mr. Yamani expressed his thoughts, lamenting that starting tomorrow, he would simply be another old man waiting for death in his remaining years. Mr. Yamani had served at the Hakone checkpoint for 30 years, but one particular day stood out, unrequited 
recorded in their logbook. It was a day he recalls vividly as if it were yesterday. On that exceptional day, everyone, including thieves and criminals, could pass through the checkpoint freely. People embraced each other, shouted joyfully, beat drums, and danced without inhibition, letting themselves be carried away by the moment. Mr. Yamani reminisced about the events of that day, 30 years ago, the trio's argument about how to pass the hack on checkpoint without a travel permit. Our badass Mugen suggested he would kill anyone who tried to stop them. However, Jin warned him that breaking through the checkpoint meant facing death on the spot, especially considering Hakon's reputation for being extremely difficult to pass through. Suddenly, a man approached them and offered to sell them a travel permit and a lucky charm. Following that, they went to the checkpoint and presented the travel permit, but they were arrested for forging the permit. That was the first time Mr. Yamani saw them when he was still a footman and started as a government official. He saw Mugen's eyes flashing like those of a stray dog. After that, Fu was forced to strip down for a search, as they suspected she was hiding contraband. Meanwhile, Jin and Mugen endured torture at the hands of Kinugusa, the corrupt top official at the checkpoint. His influential father shielded him from complaints in Edo. Kinugusa was surprised when one of his subordinates whispered something to him, prompting a search for wanted individuals' dead bodies. After that, Kinugusa offered to spare their lives under one condition. Mugen must deliver a head to another post. If he fails to return by sunset, Fu and Jin will be executed. A policeman informed Mugen about the Tengu, a terrifying creature with grotesque appearances who attacks with incredible speed and resides on the mountain. Following this, Mugen bid his farewells and began his journey. Kinugusa then ordered Yamani to follow Mugen and keep a close watch to ensure he didn't attempt to escape. As Mugen ran into the mountains, he noticed someone following him, so he hid to see who was approaching. He was surprised to see a man jogging while Mr. Yamani hid among the trees. After that, Mugen continued to run and noticed the true Tengu following him. He jumped off cliffs, traversed through trees, crossed rivers, and managed to escape, hiding in a tree. And he realized he didn't know where he was. Meanwhile, Fu and Jin remained locked up, waiting for his return. While walking, Mugen reached the edge of the cliff, where he saw a plantation of contraband plants. He then fell into a trap set by the Tengu. Meanwhile, a crowd gathered around the Tengu, where their boss declared a revolutionary war against the government and presented Mugen as an intruder. Mr. Yamani was surprised to see Mugen captured. The Tengu boss announced that Mugen would be executed by tomorrow. Meanwhile, Mugen was locked up, and Mr. Yamani attempted to help him escape but got caught by the guards. They were both locked up and awaiting their execution the next day. Mr. Yamani managed to free himself from his bindings by breaking his bones and borrowing Mugen's getta. He set up a fire and used the head of a criminal as a prop to get the guards' attention, shouting that there was a fire. When the guards entered, he swiftly kicked him with Mugen's getta. As they ran, the Tengu surrounded them. Mugen and Mr. Yamani hid among the plants and skillfully defeated the Tengu one by one. The boss grew furious upon seeing his plantation on fire. Mugen and the boss started hallucinating as they inhaled the smoke from the burning plants. On the other side, Fu and Jin faced their execution waiting for Mugen's return. Fu pleaded with them to wait a few more minutes, and they saw a distant figure running towards them, expecting it to be Mugen. However, to their surprise, it was the man who jogged all day. As the sun set, their execution was about to begin. Suddenly, smoke billowed from the plants, causing everyone to hallucinate, laughing, crying, running, and dancing ensued. The next day, Jin and Fu managed to escape the chaotic scene and started walking. Fu couldn't believe Mugen hadn't shown up, asking what had happened to him. They stopped when they heard laughter echoing through the mountains. Surprisingly, they found Mugen and Mr. Yamani laughing alongside the Tengu boss. Fu burst into anger towards Mugen. And thus, the untold story from 30 years ago, a one particular day unrecorded in Mr. Yamani's old logbook. On the other side, Tajima, a master teacher from Sekasai School, encounters Yukon, who challenges him to a duel. In the blink of an eye, Yukon countered Tajima's attack, causing him to bleed and fall on the river lifeless. The next day, Fu felt hungry and Mugen, tired of hearing it, jokingly suggested she eat his hot dog and drink it with river water after eating. Seriously, what the f are you doing? A priest suddenly appeared and offered them food in exchange for cleaning his place. The trio began cleaning the priest's place. Still, Mugen got annoyed when the priest kept ordering him around one after another. Luckily, Fu managed to silence him. But Mugen accidentally makes a mess, causing the Buddha figure to fall onto the ground. Following that, Fu goes into town and notices people gathered. A man informs her about another street killing, mentioning that the killer is targeting skilled samurai and pointing out that there's a bounty reward for his head. After returning, Fu informed the two idiots about the bounty rewards offered for catching the killer. Interested, Mugen began searching for the killer, with Fu following closely behind. 
They approached a man in town to inquire for more clues about the killer, but the man was choked, losing consciousness. So the cook informed them that Master Seishiro was the best samurai master in the city. Mujin deduced that the killer would target him next, prompting him to pursue this lead. Following that, Mujin managed to track Master Seishiro, but the bodyguards mistook him for the street killer and attacked. Mujin swiftly dodged their blows and countered, defeating the bodyguards while clarifying that he was not the street killer. Following that, the priest called for Jin, informing him that dinner had already been served. Jin mentioned that he would finish the last log and accidentally splatter wood toward the priest. However, the priest skillfully caught the log, surprising Jin with his fast reflexes. On the other hand, Mujin witnessed Yukon killing someone from the bridge. He cautiously followed Yukon until they reached a food stall. Mujin ordered a drink while Yukon silently drank on the side. The owner warned them about the killer who had made the area dangerous recently. When Mujin requested another drink, the owner declined, stating Mujin had only paid for one. Yukon intervened and offered Mujin a drink. Mujin thanked him for the drink and asked Yukon if he knew anything about the street killer. Yukon replied that he had no idea, he preferred to remain out of touch with public affairs. After that, they went for a walk. Yukon shared a story about a man who climbed an incredibly tall mountain to make people recognize his greatness. In the end, the man made the mountain his home and became a demon. However, Mujin was unable to fully understand the moral of the story. Following that, they bid goodbye to each other. They seemingly went their separate ways when suddenly Mujin drew his sword, accusing Yukon of being the street killer. Yukon then drew his own sword and assumed his fighting stance. Mujin lunged forward, but Yukon dodged and countered, landing a blow on Mujin. In a brief pause, Yukon expressed admiration for Mujin's skills. However, their fight was interrupted by the arrival of the police. Yukon swiftly fled the scene, challenging Mujin to a duel under the full moon at the exact location. Location. Mujin noticed his hand was bleeding from the exchanges with Yukon. Meanwhile, Jin stoked the fire while the priest enjoyed his sauna. Suddenly, Jin drew his sword and tested the old priest's reflexes. Fu intervened, questioning Jin's actions. Jin apologized, explaining that the priest's quick movements made him suspicious. Mujin then entered, and Fu asked him what had happened. Jin also noticed Mujin's bleeding hand and asked if he had encountered the street killer. Mujin confirmed it, describing the killer had a weird-ass sword and a unique fighting style akin to a mighty wind. The priest interjected, revealing that the killer was Yukon, once a pupil in his own dojo. The priest elaborated, detailing Yukon's dedication to martial arts, spending each day immersed in its study. Eventually, Yukon embarked on a sea voyage, but disaster struck, and the ship sank. Miraculously, Yukon washed ashore on another continent, encountering a peculiar martial art that profoundly influenced him. Upon returning to town, he found it drastically changed. He sought out the priest to announce his mastery of a technique called hake. Yukon harbored intentions of addressing the corruption plaguing the country. One day, Yukon killed one of his classmates during their training session, leading to his expulsion from the dojo by the priest. In rage, Yukon attempted to attack the priest, who defended himself but sustained a wound to his hand in the process. Following this incident, Yukon began a spree of traveling from dojo to dojo, murdering each master he encountered. The priest felt a deep sadness and remorse for his inability to save the soul of his pupil. Mujin abruptly stood up and left the room, his gaze fixed on the moon, seeming almost eager to confront Yukon. The next day, Mujin began his rigorous training regimen, dedicating himself entirely to honing his skills. Fu remarked on Mujin's unprecedented focus, to which Jin explained that Mujin's intense training indicated that he wasn't sure if he could defeat his opponent. As the night fell and the moon reached its fullness, Mujin bid farewell to the two. Fu reminded him that he would help her find the Sunflower Samurai, to which Mujin affirmed. Jin also reminded Mujin of their agreement that Jin was the one who should kill him. Meanwhile, the old priest prayed beside the waterfalls, adding a somber atmosphere to the impending duel. After that, the two face each other, Mujin suggests they skip introductions and begin their battle. Yukon wasted no time and unleashed a Kai wind from his sword. Mujin swiftly dodged the attack and closed the distance between them. However, Yukon skillfully countered, knocking Mujin to the ground. Despite being pushed down, Mujin quickly evaded another of Yukon's attacks, sending Mujin tumbling into the river below. They exchanged another series of strikes, with Yukon landing a powerful kick that sent Mujin crashing into the bridge. Despite the impact, Mujin regained his footing. As Yukon assumed his fighting stance, Mujin mirrored his movements, unleashing his Kai wind. Their swords clashed once more, both weapons were sent flying. Yukon was astonished to see Mujin replicate his technique. As Mujin coughed up blood and began to lose consciousness, Yukon charged forward, intending to deliver a finishing blow with his hake technique. However, in a last-ditch effort, Mujin swiftly drew his dagger and struck Yukon, causing him to collapse lifelessly into the river. The next day, the trio continued their journey. Fu managed to work at the restaurant as a waitress, while Jin encountered a beautiful girl named Shino standing on a bridge, seemingly lost in thought. 
concerned for her safety, Jin warned her against jumping off the bridge to harm herself. However, Shino assured him that she had no intention of causing herself harm, thanked Jin for his concern, and then departed. While Mujin indulged in beetle sumo wrestling at a gambling event, Jin found himself at the grilled eel stall where he worked part-time. To his surprise, Shino appeared and ordered a grilled eel. Not skilled at catching eels, Jin received help from Shino, who demonstrated the proper technique and assisted him in slicing the eel properly. As customers began to arrive one after another, Shino found herself helping Jin to sell more grilled eels. After an hour of bustling activity, as the customers left, Shino realized that she hadn't intended to work there. Jin, grateful for her assistance, offered her a free grilled eel as repayment for her help. After eating, Shino bid Jin farewell and expressed her gratitude for the memories they shared. Jin asked her about the memories, prompting Shino to reveal that tomorrow, she would begin working at a brothel to repay her husband's debt, with herself as collateral. She explained that it was her last day of freedom to wander around and bid goodbye, leaving Jin heartbroken. After returning to their apartment, Fu questioned Mujin about his presence there. Mujin revealed that he had quit his job as a bodyguard to focus on gambling on beetle sumo wrestling. Angered by his decision, Fu shouted at Mujin, lecturing him to stop his irresponsible gambling habits. Following that, Jin visited the brothel to return Shino's umbrella. Shino thanked him but declined, stating that she didn't need it anymore since she wasn't allowed to go outside. Abruptly, her boss called for her, signaling that she had a customer. Shino bid Jin goodbye. Arigato. <laughs> Meanwhile, Mujin continued gambling on Beetle Sumo Wrestling, together with Fu. What? What the? Mujin cheered loudly for his Beetle, Rodriguez, who surprisingly won the match. Fu was amazed that Mujin's training with the Beetle had paid off. On the other hand, Jin revisited Shino at the brothel. Shino told him she didn't have time to chat and asked Jin to leave, explaining that his presence interfered with her work. She requested him not to come back again. Suddenly, Shino's boss intervened, asking Jin if he had chosen a girl who caught his fancy. Jin replied that he had no money to pay for any services. As a result, the boss immediately called his guards, declaring Jin a window shopper and ordering them to beat him. Despite being attacked, our poor Jin did not fight back and let the guards beat him. As the ugly customer enjoyed Valentine's Day with Shino, Jin slowly walked away from the brothel, lost in thought about Shino and their brief encounter. Following that, the two gamblers' gods counted their winnings happily, Jin arrived looking battered. Fu expressed concern and asked Jin what had happened to him. Still, Jin noticed Mu Jin's money and immediately asked to borrow it. Confused, Fu asked Jin what he needed it for, to which Jin replied that he needed to buy a woman, leaving the two shocked. After that, Jin comes back to the brothel to buy Shino. Jin is greeted by the boss, who welcomes him and notices that Jin has money, confiscating his sword as per the house rules. Meanwhile, Fu wonders why Jin intended to buy a woman. Back at the brothel, Jin and Shino talk, with Jin revealing that he is a traveler. They had stopped in that town because of the rain, prompting Shino to inquire whether Jin planned to leave once the rain stopped. However, Jin expresses his hope that the rain will never stop so that he can stay there forever. Surprised by his sentiment, Shino kisses Jin, and they embark on Valentine's Day, Part 2. Meanwhile, at the restaurant, Fu overhears the owner of the brothel saying that there is a customer, a samurai wearing glasses, who has taken a liking for his new girl Shino, who had sold to him to cover her husband's debts, a wife who can't file for divorce against her lousy husband. Back at the brothel, after the fight, Jin invited Shino to leave the brothel, expressing his desire to free her from such a demeaning job. Still, Shino declined, remarking it wasn't as simple as it sounded. Their conversation was interrupted when Shino was called to attend to a visitor. She acknowledged Jin's efforts but advised him that their time together was akin to a fairy tale, and suggested he return home. Outside, Shino's husband pleaded with her for some money, but she suggested he give up gambling and find honest work instead. This suggestion angered him, and he lashed out by slapping her. Jin intervened, but Shino pleaded with him to let her husband go despite the abuse she endured. After returning to their apartment but finding it difficult to sleep, Jin decided to go out. Fu intervened, questioning whether he was truly in love with Shino and asserting he wouldn't run away with her. Jin responded that if he didn't return, they should continue their journey without him. Fu reminded him of his promise to help her find the Sunflower Samurai. Still, Jin turned away, asking for her forgiveness. Unbeknownst to them, Mujin overheard their entire conversation from inside. After returning to the brothel, Jin informed Shino that they were leaving. However, Shino declined once again, stating that she couldn't leave because even if she managed to escape, they would continue to pursue her. 
Jin noticed a divorce temple across the river and suggested that the people there could help her. Despite his suggestion, Shino declined once more. Jin then questioned if, when they first met at the bridge, she had really intended to kill herself. Shino confirmed this but then decided to leave with Jin. As they attempted to escape, the boss intervened, summoning his bodyguards to pursue Jin and Shino. They were quickly surrounded by the ugly monkeys. Jin fought them off using his bare hands while Mujin and Fu rushed to assist him. With Jin's skill and Mujin's intervention, they managed to overpower the guards. Meanwhile, Jin and Shino made a run for the river. Shino boarded a boat, but her husband suddenly appeared, pleading with her not to leave him. Stop it. Get some help. Shino angrily threw pennies at him, declaring that was the price of a woman who used to be his wife. As the guards closed in on them, Jin pushed the boat away, allowing Shino to escape. Watching from the shore, Shino wept with gratitude, thanking Jin for his assistance. With determination, Jin turned to face the approaching guards and killed them to ensure Shino's freedom. The next day, Fu relaxed in the hot spring, enjoying a moment. At the same time, the two idiots engaged in a heated argument about their journey frustrated that Fu hadn't shared more information about the sunflower samurai. And now, Fu says they are heading to Nagasaki because Jiaoji told her to go there to find some answers. Mujin has a doubt that information from Jiaoji is unreliable. But Jin informed him that Jiaoji was the chief merchant of the East India Company's Japan branch, stating that as a high-ranking official, his information was likely trustworthy. Mujin expressed frustration, arguing that Fu must know more about the Sunflower Samurai than she was letting on and accusing her of hiding information from them. He emphasized that without any other leads, they had no choice but to follow her guidance, even if it meant relying on incomplete information. Unable to resist his curiosity, Mujin decided to sneak a peek at Fu while she was bathing. Carefully, he approached her basket and retrieved something from it without her noticing. Following that, as Mujin returned, Jin cautioned Mujin against stealing other people's belongings. Mujin, however, justified his actions by pointing out Fu's secrecy regarding the Sunflower Samurai. When Mujin attempted to inspect what he took, he could not read the text. Curious, Jin took a look and realized it was Fu's diary. Mujin expressed satisfaction at the prospect of knowing something secretive about the Sunflower Samurai from Fu's diary. He then suggested to Jin to read it loudly so he could understand what was written in Fu's diary. Jin started to read the first page. That's on July 10th, a sunny day. It's been a year since Fu's mother died. She was always told that she would set out on a journey but ended up working at the tea house. Still, the day had finally come for her to set out and made a promise that starting that day, she would keep that diary until she found the samurai who smelled of sunflowers so she wouldn't forget her journey. Since the tea house burned down, she has no choice but to start her trip and the fire was caused by a couple of unbelievable guys. The two idiots looked at each other because Fu had mentioned them as an unbelievable guy in her diary. Fu said that the first one to show up at the tea house was a crude and vulgar guy with wild hair, and she thought he was a bad person who would commit all sorts of crimes. But then, once she talked to him, she learned that she was right about him. Mujin got pissed when he heard it. Fu admitted that she needed help because the stupid son of the governor thought he could do whatever he wanted. Once he started, he didn't know when to stop and went overboard. If Fu knew he would be like that, she would have taken her chances with the governor's son. Just then, another man appeared, one with long hair and glasses. Unlike the first one, she thought this new guy was kind of attractive, but it was like this new guy refused to stop fighting once he'd started, too. Deep down, they're two of a kind. Anyway, that was how she came to set on her journey accompanied by these two men, the end. Jin continued to read through Fu's diary, page by page, uncovering its contents as they went along. When Fu was kidnapped and held hostage by Big Show and Runjiro. When the pervert Takamiya was about to have his way with her. And then she got kidnapped again by the ugly monkeys, thought that her life was a little too eventful, even though she had two bodyguards. Then, she made a mistake when she modeled for Morinabu's paintings. And the day she competes in an eating contest. That reminds her that starting that day, they were heading to Nagasaki. And the only reason she came to Edo City was because she heard rumors that the Sunflower Samurai was there. And then she got hostage again by Shinsuke. And remember the day she got hit by the weirdos guy Nagamitsu. And the day they got prisoner again at the checkpoint. And the worst part was Mujin, she decided never to trust him again. And the day they met the old priest who let them sleep and eat for free. Looking back on things now, she might have gone through a lot of lousy things. If she hadn't met them in the tea house that day, she might still be working there right now. And it was a once in a lifetime chance encounter. And she hopes the three of them can keep traveling till the very end. She thinks positively that those two are thinking the same thing. After that, Mujin and Jin were left stunned as Jin read aloud the last page of Fu's diary, revealing that Fu had fabricated the contents to teach the two a lesson for snooping without permission. Mujin shouts in anger, echoing through the hot spring, causing Fu to awaken. Thank you for watching, guys. I hope you love this anime. Have a good day.